Hello there. Welcome to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. I'm your host, Renee Bauer, and I am here today with a really fun guest, uh, and we're going to dive into some a really fun topic. So let me introduce you to her. Dr. Allison J.K. is a pioneer in the field of energy medicine and holistic thriving. She is an internationally recognized, award-winning energy healer and is a master mind-body energy medicine practitioner, yoga, and meditation teacher, and has been doing that for over 25 years. She is the founder of the Vibrational Upgrade System. I can't wait to talk about that. And she was the host of a top five radio show on Voice America's empowerment channel called Create Your Best Life Ever. She's the author of the award-winning book, What If There's Nothing Wrong, and two international bestsellers. And she was kind enough to spend the next half hour with us so we can tap into all of her awesomeness. So welcome, Ah. Dr. Allison. Hey, Renee. Hi, listeners. It's not my awesomeness. It's the awesomeness of this universe that I just have flow through me. We're all awesome. All right, so then let's talk about that. Like, <laughs> okay. I, I, I love that whole kind of high vibing, trust the universe, put it out there, manifestation and all of that. So how do we tap into this? So it's, I like what you said in there because you had the word trust the universe. And um, I know that this year, Renee, pardon me, is this live? No, is it's it not. It's recorded. Okay. Do you know when this will be airing? Um, so I'll let you know, but it will be in the new year. In the new year. Okay. So we're now in 2021. Woohoo! But I've been talking about this since around 2011. And part of uh, Voice America approached me to do a radio show about the Mayan predictions for 2012 back in 2011. I just come back from my decade living in Asia and studying subtle energy and getting certified as a yoga teacher, blah, blah, blah. It's not blah, 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 but for the brevity here for our purposes, I wasn't doing anything about the Mayan uh, predictions for 2012. And yet I got a huge yes. Um, called them back and said, yeah, I want to do it. Interviewed a bunch of experts, ended up at Chichen Itza, the main Mayan pyramid on December 21st, 2012. Continued to talk with other specialists in other disciplines like in yoga. And there's this whole understanding that from 2012-ish to 2032, we're going through 20 years of our most intense evolutionary shift ever. So what I've been seeing since about, I came back in 2010 from that decade in Asia since about 2011 people have been having a slew of things happen all at once a lot of people in those earlier awakening days uh, had divorce job loss loss of a parent or loved one uh, through death as well or a medical diagnosis so there was like usually three things hitting at once and what that seemed to be from about 2011 ish to about 2014 ish were early awakeners now i had already been doing this work for decades i'm just naturally like this but others in this great awakening time which is a nickname for or what it's termed this 20-year window others have used crisis multiple crises in order to change their lives Mm -hmm. now we fast forward all the way to 2020 and um it seems like it's a global sweep for those who didn't do it proactively through their own individual crises they then have been using the covid crisis for the way to go inside so i came back from um asia knowing that my mission was to help reduce the suffering in the west because we're so attuned to the external world and the external measurements and not taught any tools nor valued in our society the heart over the intellect mm-hmm. for example or the energy the invisible over the visible physical so we go to a movie theater the bigger the, um, the screen is the louder the sound effects are the bigger the blow-ups are the more power it seems to have and it's completely um, the opposite when working with energy and working with the forces of ancient wisdom and ancient secrets and subtle energy. So what I love to turn people on with, especially when they're going through crisis or making a proactive choice, like choosing to divorce instead of prolonging suffering Mm -hmm. is it's typical that however your mind is labeling an event, it is actually the opposite when looked at from the soul level or the universe's level. Okay. Tell me more. So when we're like, I'm training um, vibration upgrade practitioners, I certify folks and my system is a combination of mindfulness. So from the meditation yoga field with energy medicine, so clearing of what I call the back of the house consciousness. So unconscious and subconscious blocks that come in from parental imprints, from conditioning, from karma, from past lives, from trauma, 
from old contracts from other lifetimes across different timelines. I mean, it gets really complex, but the bottom line is vibrational upgrade. I train certified in certified practitioners. In, and when I do that, I'm telling them about how this isn't about focusing on the problem. Let me back up for a second, Renee, because it's really interesting as I've been doing this work and marketing it, right? I've been told that we're supposed to push the pain point. You bring up a problem, you push the pain point in sales and marketing, and then you present your work or your product as the solution. I have always refused to do that because it's fear-based. And instead I've done this in more, it's now understood as inspirational marketing. And people tend to not do this kind of internal exploration unless they're forced to in the West. Um, or they think of like spiritual growth or working on their beliefs and their consciousness as something to do when they have the time. Mm. But I need to address my external reality. I need to address, I could bring over all my clipboards, my to-do task list. I need to get things knocked off. I need to go to the store. I need to pick up the kids. I need to do the laundry, all these external tasks. And so unless they have a problem that then they show up um, on one of the calls with me or my sales team and saying, well, I've had chronic back pain or, well, I'm, I just lost my job or, well, I'm going through divorce or I've just lost my parent or I want to change careers. I have this great idea. I want to start a business. Unless it's mostly problem focused, it seems like they won't work internally. It's viewed as extracurricular. But what I teach my practitioners is, is that wherever there is like this block, that's not just one simple block that is easier to clear, but like a foundational behavioral pattern. It's called samskaras in Sanskrit in the yogic wisdom. And each of us are born with like two-ish of them. <laughs> Two-ish. <-ish. laughs> Some of us have more. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it doesn't go over to like five, right? So let's just say two or three-ish. Um, and that, it's almost like it's a yarn ball and it's a family of beliefs that other blocks circle around and are involved with. So let's say you have a fear of rejection. So what that really is dealing with is how do you step into approving of yourself and presenting yourself in such a loving way that it magnetizes love from others towards you. Like it's a turning of what seems to be the core foundational problem block or issue or habit and then realizing that there's a gem in it because it's usually the opposite of what our mind construes. So my first book is called, What If There's Nothing Wrong? We are so used to being problem solving um, right. focused, you know? And so if you're going through a divorce, hopefully you're doing it proactively. And if you're not, then, I mean, it's too trite to say, what are the benefits? you're gaining, look at the bigger picture. What's really wanting to happen is almost like getting turned inside out in these times we're living in now. So allowing yourself to make the most out of the change you're already going through, or the change that has been thrust upon you because you didn't do it proactively, frankly. You know, you chose your comfort zone, you chose staying um, with the familiar, with the similar through the years. So then you had to have change thrust upon you. One of the things that I know about myself and I tell the people who are working with me at the appropriate time is I get uncomfortable every time I get comfortable. Like I don't, I'm not comfortable if things stay the same. I get, you know, I, I, so if you are choosing things to stay the same, it's because the ego mind, I don't mean constant change where like you change partners every year, but I, I do mean a more grounded sense of <clears throat> stillness and stagnancy and being able to monitor for that because as energy is a wave, so is our lives. We're supposed to be in constant evolution. And so the ego mind, which is a structure we're given to help us navigate the physical plane, make sense out of the physical 3D world and stay safe in the unknown, in the jungle of the lions and the tigers and the bears. Well, it likes the, un, it likes the known. So we have a predisposition with our thoughts to want to stay the same, to want to choose the comfortable choice. So that's in great part why it seems like so many people need crisis to come out of the familiar, but understanding that we're in times now in particular that, for example, every time we get a new idea for something creative and inspiration, like for a new revenue stream, if we don't follow that, 
we get extra vitality, extra chi or life force that surges up within us because our soul and our heart is saying, let's do this new thing. If we say no out of fear and we don't choose it, that energy gets suppressed back down or we end up deep pressing that energy. So there's an actual chakra involved here and then it ends up being a sense of depression and lower energy and lethargicness. So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in the subtle energy system that if we were to learn how to work with in a much more capable fashion, not advanced like me, but just at a beginner level so you can manage yourself for more thriving, that's what I'm up to. And, and using your divorce for that would be the best choice possible. So if the, if the default is when something is uncomfortable, you don't do that. Is that, is that kind of like the trigger point? Is that that? the kind of like that gut instinct saying um, that you should be, be doing that thing. And it's sort of like that fear that stops you because it's too uncomfortable. It's too new. You don't know what comes out the other end. Like, should we be really paying attention to that and saying, wait a second, we're starting to feel uncomfortable and maybe because that's the right thing or the next step. Yep. Physiologically excitement and fear is the same. Hmm. It's a neat little trick of the divine, you know? Yes, <laughs> I know. So that's a great gauge, Renee, to, to help your listeners better manage themselves. So if you're feeling unchallenged, then know that you're honoring like the status quo. Now we, and that's not necessarily what we're here to do. You, we can give ourselves periods of rest. And when we're incubating new inside, what it looks like outside is possibly less productivity, possibly more rest, possibly less work. And if you look at what's happened in 2020 with COVID, there's been a heck of a lot of that created. Again, to create the space to go inside. So when there are times of incubation or seeding like pregnancy of a new life or of a new idea or a new project or a new path, then there is a sense of, you're not outwardly taking steps and saying yes to things where you would be challenged to feel uncomfortable. But when you are aware that it's starting to feel still, you're starting to feel bored, it's starting to feel stagnant and you go to make a change and then you're getting all fearful and you want to withdraw, that's when it is. Do you believe in this kind of this thought that some people just function at a high vibration and you have other people who function at a much lower vibration and does that impact um, our relationships? That's two different questions, right? Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I understand that to be two different questions and I hear you the relationship dynamic implied in there that you're asking about. So I'm going to relate it to something I think that's pretty common. Have You've heard of the old soul and new soul? Oh yeah. Yeah. So I feel like that's a hierarchical egotistical way of talking about souls. Um, and I don't even feel like that applies. Um, while from what I know, Renee, I was born, I could go into something about black sheep here. So very briefly, a lot of the times black sheep are actually the higher vibrational people within their immediate family. And they're born with a higher vibration and that calls up resistance of, or fear in the family members around them because the family members don't wanna look inside they don't want to deal, whereas the higher vibration catalyzes that. So when I'm training my, uh, back in the day when I did Yusui Reiki trainings only, but now I'm training people in that and vibrational upgrade system, one of the parts of Reiki is that as you become lighter, I was warned like in my second degree back in the 90s, you're going to catalyze more fear around you. So I found that happening. Like I had two different, when I went overseas to work in the international school system, I had two different roommates two years in a row in the teacher provided housing that I originally lived in. And both of those roommates had a hard time with my vibration. Um, and what and did I that knew, look like? Like what did so that what mean? What it looked like was the first um, roommate, unbeknownst to me, had been suicidal before moving in with me, which was not a good match. Mm. So I'm different than the average person but still nonetheless my vibration caused her to feel like she, d she didn't want to look inside because then she'd have to deal with the parts of her that were you know talking to her about suicide and so 
the resistance was there, like pushing me away, like not liking my practices. And I don't talk about this to people who don't want to talk about it. I mean, I do it for a profession, for God's sakes. I did it on the side even then as I was a full-time career teacher and administrator. So it wasn't like I was talking to her about, let's sit down and look at your stuff. You know, I mean, it was just by my presence. And, and so she eventually had to move out because she was so afraid of what was getting called up in her to deal with. The second one was just, a, she was Italian and American and much more feisty. So she just was like combative like just kind of feisty and, and, and not settled, didn't let herself feel the calm in the presence in my field that so many other people feel. So there's this resistance to going within because I find like in the West, it's almost like people believe they have a boogeyman uh, underneath the bed behind, in the back of their head. So if we go inside, we're either gonna find that monster or we're gonna find out that we're crazy. And a basic premise in all Buddhist teachings, the very first one is every human mind is a neurotic mind. The rest of Buddhism is here are the tools to learn how to deal with your own particular flavor of neuroses. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh, me too. So is there a higher vibrational person than others and are people born that way? I was born higher vibrational. I think that I've come to see from all the thousands and tens of thousands of people at this point I've worked with, there is a particular profile of our black sheep and they tend to be of the spiritual nature. Mm. Um, and so... I would say yes, there tend to be people born in higher vibration, but it, then it depends on what the black sheep does with the black sheepness, because then they could go really low. So then in a relationship, typically, like I gave those two roommate examples, when I work with a woman and she's married or has a partner or spouse, spouse is marriage, Allison, I see a lot of the time, like my female client will go home and the pheromones will exchange at night in her higher, getting higher and higher vibration, she gets cleared of more of the back of the head density or consciousness or old beliefs or old traumas. And they're sleeping together. The male will usually, within a matter of like, starting in about the third month or so, start to like have ankle pain, for example. This is one of them, because he had an old ankle injury. Another one started to really deal with his focus on lack of money and how she was, oh, she increasingly believed about abundance and he was, having his lack show up more and more. So there, as they got lighter, now here's another example where a husband and wife were more equal. She would take in the teachings and he ended in, in the energy and raise her vibration and he ended up starting a whole new business. And he says, I know this is from working with Dr. Allison being in a program. So, I mean, there's choice. That third husband chose to ride along the waves and make use of it because he had enough of a framework himself to appreciate it and understand it. The other two men, the middle man, he, was, he started to learn how to work with it. The first one didn't know. So when, you're raise, when my clients raise their vibrations, they're tending to entrain the people in their field, especially the person sleeping next to, up to their vibration. So I, see, I have seen people lose their patience and leave their spouses. I've seen um, it get to a, a catalyzing moment where the spouse just isn't choosing to grow, and my client is, and they just say no enough, and they in fact, have come to me to work with me in order to have the strength to move through the, that choice and make the choice and move through the divorce. And then there's others who have engaged increasing compassion, which is always what I help support them in doing, literally helping increase the activations in their field for compassion, opening their heart so they have more, so that they can have the patience to put up with the husband <laughs> as it moves through the changes while he's not actively working with me. So, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways the guys can like every time she the third example she moves he comes right up behind her within like you know a week so there's a little bit of tension in the beginning it's like when we weight train as we're growing our muscles it first it contracts i'm a personal trainer too first it contracts and then it releases right just like an orgasm so growth is like that too so first the, the partner might resist in the growth mode and then the resistance releases and then they grow so that's so fascinating. What is one or two easy things that someone can do today to raise their vibration? So, um, you could know that you're not your thoughts. You could know that you, part of the work that I do, so it shows in all the 5,000 years of meditation, the development of the observer, the, just the sheer fact that there's a practice like meditation where you learn how to observe your thoughts means that you're not your mm -hmm. thoughts. So just take that inference. And then from there, the next step would be to question your thoughts. So you could see that, oh man, I'm so bored. 
you could see your mind pumping that thought out mm -hmm. rather than reaching for the food or reaching to turn on the streaming t service and then ask it, well, is that really even true? And then even more to so go beyond that and say, okay, so if I am bored, if that is true, what could I do? What could I choose to make this better? What could I choose to not be bored? So there's this idea in Tibetan Buddhism, and it's also in Western cognitive behavioral psychology, where you address the fear, like you address the neuroses, you address the thought, and you could even unwind the thought all the way to the end, which is a bit more advanced work and is better done with a coach. But I mean, you could possibly do it with yourself. So, okay, you're bored. What's so bad about that? Well, that means I'm not getting anywhere in life. Okay, so you're not getting anywhere in life. What does that mean? Well, it means I'm going to be homeless. Okay, so if you're homeless, what does that mean? It means I won't have a home. Okay, so have, then what will happen? Okay, so I won't have food or good clothing. Okay, so then what will happen? And then there's a point that you just realize how ridiculous it is. Right, right. Because I was reaching for the brownie because I was bored. <laughs> so, so the bottom line is cutting through this noise that shows up there because there's so much else to be accessing mm -hmm. right now. I mean, you talked about trust in the beginning, Renee, the amount of time I spend building people's heart chakras into trust so that they can more actively understand they're choosing everything that shows up or about 90%. Yeah. What about manifesting? Um, because I know that that is a, a buzzword now and, and you see a lot of people out there saying they're going to manifest their, their biggest goals and dreams and the life that they want and the Louis Vuitton bag, they're going to manifest <laughs> into their life. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about that? You stopped me right as I, or I stopped myself right as I was getting ready to go into manifesting. So perfectly done. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I have a signature program called Magic Manifestation and Money Flow, and I work with masterminders in a program focused on mastery over the manifestation process. So uh, to attempt to answer that in a short, brief way is not easy. Um, I, you asked me, what do I think about that? I think about if people are wanting to manifest Louis Vuitton bags and using the law of attraction for that, good luck. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, because it's a trick. Like I was talking about proactively choosing change, right? And so I find so much of the time people come on a call to see about working with me and they think it's about having more money or they think it's about um, getting a new partner, like something the ego would want. And then what they're really ending up doing is the higher self has brought them to me through that ego hook to actually get to something bigger within them, like to really open up their potential. So in order to catalyze the universe's forces that gives us the power to create, as if God, we have to show up in a way that's warranting that power. So if you approach it from the ego, there's no way, because then you could end up easily abusing power. You could end up easily hurting others. So it, like there's these levels of initiation that we seem to go through before we're given that power. Now I can think about something and so can my most advanced students. They can, I just did this today. Another one just did it last night. Like I do it all the time, depending on how big the manifestation is even just want something, desire something from my lighter heart vibration. And it shows up something to help me before I've even done any manifestation work or any of the energy procedures I teach others to do. This is a loving, supportive universe. It wants us to be um, feeling the unconditional love and support that is at every cell, every life force cell, every, my second book I end with saying, so love force, life force, and soul force, it's all the same thing. And that's chi, that's the life force that animates all of life. But um, it, there are these levels of initiation that we, I, I, I'm repeating this and I'm sorry because it just is so oversimplified on social media, the idea of manifesting and it's feeding the ego. So all marketing and all like social media, unless it's upliftment or inspirational marketing, it feeds the ego. So it's a breeding ground for misapplying the understanding of what it means to step into the power to manifest out of the ethers, out of energy into something physical. Like I can't create a pen, right. you know, but I can have the, you know, I'm thinking about how I want to boost my um, SEO um, performance. And then in comes two emails offering support for that. So without me having to do any Googling or any LinkedIn so search. 
so that's not just coincidence because I have my entire life. I have had experiences like that where you think something and then a minute later, it's like, it's there, there's something related to that. And I used to be like, wow, that's so cool. You know, it was like, did you throw out of that? Wow. That's so cool. Reaction. No, no. I mean, that still happens on a regular basis. No, but do you still think it's cool? Oh, I think it's so cool. <laughs> okay, so we're all born. I'm so grateful that you brought that up and took it in this direction. We're all born with that. And you can do it even more as a kid. Remember all the weird things you and your friends used to try out doing with manifesting in your thoughts? But we then grow cynical and then we grow science-based and then we grow intellectually based and we need an explanation for everything. And then we get heavy with life experience. And so then we don't yeah. feel so light and free to be able to just create. So in regards to the word choice coincidence, Renee, it's really interesting because there's a saying out there that I love that people who still believe in coincidences aren't awake mm. and that they're actually synchronicities. They're actually, I mean, you can choose to just believe they're coincidences. Right. You know, if I find that I'm going to choose to go beyond coincidences and believe in synchronicities because that enriches my life experience so much more. Right. It's dry, it's still, it's unalive, it's just not fun to think it's just a coincidence and dismiss it. Besides, I have had so many synchronicities happen in my life in honor of supporting my life that it's impossible to construe it as just a coincidence. It's just impossible. I mean, you'd have to be just, I talk about this in my last book, reasonable dragons it's like there is this over swing of the pendulum now so far into needing scientific proof keep you know take out of it all of the american society in the last couple of years under trump but this over reliance on needing scientific proof for everything it's like sticking your head in the sand when there's something so easily observable and because it doesn't have like some backing from some study that's been replicated then therefore i can't quote it as something real this is part of the rebalancing that's happening right now between the divine feminine and the divine masculine. Mm. I love scientific proof. That's great. But, you know, part of naturally observing a phenomena is the third scientific method, for God's sakes. Right. You know, so if I can observe the feeling I have when these two things co co correspond, then I can get uplifted and I can have ease in my life. Why am I not going to choose to believe in that? Why am I not going to see that as a grace that's given to me and in my life um, rather than, yeah, it's nice. Why don't I work with that instead and see what else I can create? Right. Like it's like the, the scientific and out of balance masculine paradigm that we've been living under for a couple hundred years in the West has so dried up life, you know, and made it be mechanical and from the mind rather than the yang, which is great for action and the yin, which is good for pulling in and understanding the internal and these two in balance let me understand what just happened. Oh, wow, I have a new awareness. And now I have a new idea. Let me choose. And now let me, let me step out and take action based on that choice and let the two balance instead of an over-dominance one or the other. Mm, that's fascinating. So you're talking about letting it flow, right? Rather, and like yeah. kind of letting control, like, like go of that control that so many yeah. of us like feel like we have to control everything rather than just putting it out there. And that's and ego mind fear. The, the having to control everything. It's the ego mind really afraid of the soul force because what's really powerful, what called in all those manifestations that you were able to, it's the soul. Mm -hmm. the, the mind just doesn't create. It's not of, of that resonance of creation. The mind calculates, it's mechanical, but the soul is the creative force. The heart is the creative force. So it's fascinating. I can talk to you all day long. <laughs> Boston, I know we've New York accent. What's your oh, accent? It's, it's Boston. Yeah, I'm originally from there. What part of Austin? Uh, Stoneham. Oh, wow. I'm originally from Easton. Oh, okay. That's so funny. Everyone says New York. I've heard Canada. I've heard Rhode Island. You're Canada. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I live in Connecticut now. It's the state with no accent. So <laughs> it's true. But I, I'm, I'm so fascinated with your work and I know that we've like barely scratched the surface of it because you've spent 25 years studying it. We can't Thank nearly you, get deep into it uh, in, in a half hour, but you have an incredible private Facebook group that I think has like over a hundred thousand members in it. What, what, um, can anyone join that? Yeah. You just have to answer three simple questions. The, it's the vibrational upgrade free Facebook group. Uh, sustain your vibration and I don't remember the name of the tagline of it vibration upgrade 
I'll, I'll, I'll put that link in the show notes anyway. But how do how does someone who wants to work with you do that? So if you want to work with me, go to my website, um, vibrationalupgrade.com, or my name, A-L-I-S-O-N, just the letter J and then K-A-Y, and go to the work with me page. Um, if you're really interested in manifestation, I have the Magic Manifestation and Money Flow Signature Program. It, it is a, it's brilliant. Honestly, I, I like I let it be channeled through me what to create and it's just brilliant what got created through me to help clear out what needs to be cleared out now so that you can live in that flow and learn how to just manifest something that is going to make your heart sing rather than like a Louis Vuitton bag and be here like living up to your fullest potential. Yeah. You can hear it. I love it because that's what I'm all about. I used to be in politics and I used to go for change in that way. And now for decades now, I've been changing um, the collective by working with one consciousness at a time and getting a person free. And is that program, is it ongoing? Is it, does yeah, it start? Time. You can roll at any oh. time. All right, so cool. I'd love to have you in it, Renee. You'd be fun to play. <laughs> I know, I might be signing up right now. I love all of this so much. I could really talk to you all day. <laughs> so thank fun. you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am I, like, I, I'm just fascinated with all of this. So um, I loved our chat. Thank you. Renee, you know, if you can live from this joy and this fascination, that's how we're meant to live. Not like my job, the way I make money is the boring thing. Like this right. is, a, you know, absolutely it's, it's joyful all the way through. Right, and, and that's what I tell clients too in, in their marriage, to, you know, and it's like, if they're not living a happy, joyful existence, then maybe it's not the place that they need to be. And it's okay to walk away from that. It's not something that you, they should be ashamed of or embarrassed. It's, it's okay. It's, if it's not, you know, if they're not living their most fulfilling life. There's a thing that I say, if you're still addicted to the struggle paradigm, I'm not the right practitioner for you. Um, and that's the same thing you can think of with what you just said, or I think of, is that there's a lot of addiction to struggling. And so people will stay in marriages, fight it out in a lot of avoidance of what they perceive is going to be the shame if they were to admit failure, so to speak, and get a divorce. It's your life. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much. My honor. Thanks for playing with me too, Renee. <laughs>